I think it's it's the technology industry as a whole. We're not very good at inviting people to be a part of it. And mm-hmm. I think especially women, stere- you know, whether it's stereotypes or whether it's outside perception or whether it's the way that we talk about it, we sell it, we role model it. On today's podcast, we're talking to Charlotte Willis from Schroders, and we're covering topics as diverse as sailing and trampolining. But don't worry, as ever, there is a tech slant. This is Tech Talks. It's your twice-weekly technology podcast, which features interviews with leaders from across the industry and shares some news. Today on the podcast, I'm joined by Akish, Courtney and Ali in what might be the last uh, in person recording of the podcast for quite some time. Dun, dun, dun. As, as Ali said, <laughs> why are we here? Seriously, though. <laughs> We're still in the office, guys. Everyone yeah. else is not. Yeah. yeah. For everyone listening, this whole enjoy building home life. is empty. The whole building yeah. is empty. All yeah. 21 stories. And the fish remain. It's us and the fish remain. Yeah. Oh my gosh, who's going to feed the fish? Ah. That's a good point. We do have a big fish tank at the bottom of our building. So. The largest one is owned in Europe. The yep. largest privately owned fish tank in Europe. Oh, yeah, what happens if all the marine biologists are quarantined? They're going to have to come in in them big, Someone's massive suits and just sprinkle yeah. a bit of they're fish. They're already wearing scuba suits, so they, they're, <laughs> they're corona free. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> they're all good. They've got oxygen tanks they've and everything. They've got oxygen tanks. We're yeah. going to come back and there's only going to be two eels left in that day. Yeah. <laughs> they've eaten everything else. Exactly. Oh dear. Uh, Well, look, the only way to survive coronavirus may well be getting in a small 70 foot yacht and sailing into the middle of the ocean, right? I wish. Or working remotely. Or from your your boat. (laughs) Uh, And today's guest uh, has done exactly that. She sailed a quarter of the way around the world in a small fiberglass boat. So, uh, yeah, there's some advice maybe. Um, I don't know whether or not you'd be able to work remotely in the middle of the Atlantic. There's no um, air Wi-Fi there. No, no internet, is it? Yeah. Oh, no. What, what do we do now? There it is. Anyway, we'll hand over to the interview with Charlotte, and then we'll come back with some commentary and some news afterwards. Today, I'm talking to Charlotte Willis. Charlotte, thank you for giving up some time and coming in to talk to us. Hello. You are the Head of Governance at Schroders. I'll qualify that. I'm yes. the Head of Governance for Infrastructure and Production Technology at Schroders. That's probably too long for LinkedIn. Exactly. Right, okay, cool. It gets called IPS. Ah, um, what does that involve? <laughs> it's a really good question and one I think I ask myself uh, on a regular basis. I've been in this role actually not for that long, about mm-hmm. six months time. Um, previously, I was the business manager for infrastructure uh, and what that meant was things like <clears throat> um, oversight of budgets and headcounts and sort of process risk and control and that sort of thing. Um, I was promoted last year to head of governance. Mm-hmm. Governance can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, the role that I currently do is part governance, building out a new governance framework uh, and controls framework for the department I work in, which is infrastructure and production. Um, but also I have responsibilities for um, some executive reporting, like availability mm-hmm. and capacity management reporting on the health and stability of our estate, our technology estates, um, as well as technology training, as well as uh, technology purchasing and procurement. Mm. Um, and a couple of other more central um, functions below that too. So it's very business focused rather than tech, tech, deep tech focused. It is, yes. So I'm on the business side of a technology department. But I find that interesting because if you look at your background, you did actually study computer science <laughs> um, and business systems and information technology at Newcastle and Northumbria. Yep. Um, and I suppose there is that perception that there's a lot of business leaders in technology who tend to be female may have come into the industry from all sorts of different walks of life other than actually computer science. Yeah. And I would caveat that by saying I only actually did computer science for a year. Mm. And the reason there's two degrees on there is because, well, not two degrees, but two listings on there is because I did computer science for a year and I really hated it. (laughs) Right. And so I realized that I was not going to, you know, I just, I just didn't want to finish the degree. I just, just wasn't doing it for what, me. What was it about it that didn't really resonate? I didn't want to be on the inside of a computer. Right, okay. I wanted to be on the outside of a computer getting it to do really cool and funky things for me rather than writing the code that did those cool things. So the three things. years as a business systems and information technology degree at Northumbria, mm. yeah. that was what was the slant? Because obviously there is still IT in there. Yes, but it was much more the management uh, and it was a little bit of technology coding and you still had to do you mm. know, sort of some fundamentals, but it was also the management of technology and sort of the business side that went with that. So um, some, how you do technology financial management, 
uh, there was some economics and some leadership and some sort of other more rounded skills that went, or business rounded skills that went with the management of a technology environment rather than just the bites that make them. It's quite interesting that you stayed in your castle. Didn't decide to continue with the degree, but switch universities there. Yes, and that was partly uh, because I'd already been there for a year. I yeah, was, yeah. I already had built a life for myself. I had friends, a house, etc., etc. I wanted to stay, and it's a uh, good place. I wanted to stay at Newcastle, but for <laughs> whatever reason, I couldn't, um, and so I went over the road and went to Northumbria instead. My accent doesn't betray it, but I'm from the northeast. So. There we go. Yes, it was a great place to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, so I find it quite. I do find that quite interesting. Um, and especially given a comment that you made prior to a sitting record around the fact that you go to a lot of conferences and your experience is that there's lots of women there who code. Yes. Which is not the normal narrative, I suppose, that you hear. Yeah. So because I work in technology, because I'm a woman in technology, I've very much been in a minority pretty much my entire career, yes. especially coupled with the fact that I work in financial services, which is also a very male-dominated And have done for a number of years at yes. previous institutions. Exactly. Um, so my, I got to a certain point in my career where I wanted to share and give back and sort of support the next generation, and, uh, and that was really important to me. Um, and therefore, I started speaking at events and volunteering at various things and working with STEM programs and, and that sort of, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so I go to conferences, and the majority of the ones in the tech industry are that certainly I... I guess I'm exposed to that I go to um, are very tech heavy and they're very code heavy. Now, it's not, I would never say that we don't need more women than code. We absolutely do. It's a no brainer. And I think I said to you before we mm. hit record the, you know, the dangers around bias, gender bias in AI, for example, absolutely terrify me. But I don't want to forget that there's a huge other side to technology, that it is one of the largest industries in the world. You know, companies used to be banks and now they're technology companies who happen to be banks. It's, we've all, the, the technology departments of these companies are often the largest department in the company. They're often the backbone, especially current world health crises, people working from home. Mm. We couldn't do that without the technology side of it. And it's absolutely great that you've got people women especially, who can build those systems, program those systems, deploy, run, all of that. But you need people to manage them too. You need to look at the business side of it. You need to work out how much it's costing, what supplier you're working with, whether you're making the right commercial decisions, how you're staffing those departments. And actually, I see women who are really keen on going into the coding side, and that's fantastic, but I don't see many female technology business leaders. You know what? This might be really ham-fisted and, and inarticulate, uh, sorry, yeah, poor, poorly articulated rather. But there is that assumption that the traditional male techie is introverted and not very good at kind of talking to other people. And that's why they're not interested possibly in becoming a business leader. And then you kind of get someone maybe who's come from a finance or a business route and they ended up running the technology department. Yeah. But there is that kind of underlying generalized stereotype that women are really good as business analysis and project managers because they have those social skills that maybe men lack and they're able to bring people together but listening to you there it kind of suggests that the whole gender thing is a load of rubbish because you have exactly <laughs> the same split between different personality types regardless of gender uh, amongst the female population working within tech i think it's it's the technology industry as a whole we're not very good at inviting people to be a part of it and mm -hmm. I think especially women stereo you know whether it's stereotypes or whether it's outside perception or whether it's the way that we talk about it we sell it we role model it yes maybe culturally societally women are seen to be perhaps better business analysts or better project managers would a woman if given a choice between working in a other department or a technology department unless they had some kind of already innate interest in tech mm. They might look at tech and go, why would I want to work in that industry? I don't understand code. I don't understand, you know, servers or I don't understand cloud. It's, I think we're really good at pissing people off. And I'm not saying that there aren't women leaders. It's more, would they pick an industry like that to go in and be the leaders of? So if we're not trying to put people off and we're trying to say to so those women out there who might want to be business leaders of a tech mm -hmm. department yeah. and looking after the complex myriad of things that you look after, 
What do you enjoy about it? What are the things that on a day-to-day basis you go, you know what? Might seem like that was quite dull from the outside, but it's really interesting. I am, I guess, one of the stereotypically slightly outlier people that whilst I don't want to code, I am fascinated by technology. I always have been. I remember when I was a child, and I'm going to give away my years here by saying, you know, my I think one of the first things I remember is programming my parents' VCR and, you know, their Betamax, mm. you know, machine. I it, remember Betamax, yeah. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and, it, you know, pressing buttons and having one of those Casio watches and it just, I love gadgets. Absolutely yeah. love them. Um, and I'm really opinionated above, uh, about them, but that doesn't mean I want to program them. Yeah. So it was a no-brainer for me to go into a technology uh, environment, but I'm the only one of any of my non-work social who feels like that about technology. Yeah. From a management point of view, what are the challenges managing techies <laughs> that maybe make your role more interesting than it could be? It's a really interesting question, and perhaps it's exemplified by what I've just explained. The two are the two sides to a technology department, the technical side and the management side, are seen as quite polar opposite. Mm. You don't d- tend to get people jumping between the two or you get te- techie people who are promoted to a point where they're made into a manager and they may or may not have those skills. Um, what makes it interesting and sometimes challenging to me is if I have, for example, someone comes to me and go, right, we need to buy this particular type of technology infrastructure, for example, um, my natural questions will be, right, well, what vendors can supply us? How much is it going to cost? Is it in budget? Have we done the due diligence? Is it part of our strategy and roadmap? Et cetera, et cetera. Sort of the business type questions. Mm. It's not that they don't care. It's just that they don't, it's it's not something that's on their radar. It's not something they will have thought about. It's Yeah, and I suppose that's the reason for the question is that yeah. it's, there's very few professions out there where it's almost like a niche interest that's become huge yeah and you do hear stories of people who are architecting for a business and they will write something in a particular code because they just love that code and that enthusiasm that got them into the industry and real love of deep tech can be completely counterproductive to a business where you need to bring other people along with you. Yes, and things like strategic roadmaps, actually, you see, and I've seen in previous organisations, go out the window because someone, you know, went to a conference and saw a really cool piece of tech and so wants to buy from them. And if they're in a position of power, then you'll buy from them, Mm. regardless of whether it stacks up with the business case. And that's not the way to do business. So you need to ask those fundamental questions. You need to have a bit of a leg in both camps. And I do think I'm slightly fairly unique in the fact that not only do I get the opportunity to do that, and that's one of the things I really love about my job, but also translate it between the two, but that those roles exist. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you uh, about to, to kind of end on was around leadership qualities. Um, I was at Omni Women and Allies earlier this week at the time of recording and they were talking about the uh, importance of kindness in leadership. They were talking about the importance of uh, of a leader showing some vulnerability. Look at your background, you're quite sporty. You're involved in trampolining and other bits and pieces when you were at university and then you did clip around the world. Yes. Uh, Did you do, you did a leg of clip around the world? I did two legs. Two legs. A quarter of the world. Which which two legs? Um, I... Uh, sailed from Seattle, so the west coast of America, through the Panama Canal, up to New York, across the Atlantic, around the UK and back to London. Right. So for people who don't know about Clipper, uh, my sister did it and circumnavigated and it's bonkers because I got to go on the boat <laughs> and they're tiny. Uh, and 70 foot ocean racing yachts. Yeah. 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 I, I just thought it looks <laughs> like it's going to be wet for a year. And complete very strangers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what, what have you taken from those kind of experiences and possibly your sporting background and being able to marry with your role as a manager and also, I suppose, look at what's going on more broadly with, with how people perceive leadership in a modern organisation and, and how that should look. Yeah, I think actually it's probably had a huge impact on the kind of person I am and realising it or not, I think I, there probably are skills that I've learnt through those various exercises which I bring to my role and the way I manage my teams and, and the people who work for me. Um, I did trampolining a lot when I was a teenager. I did it through university. I actually carried on right up until my 30s. Mm-hmm. And then I had a rather nasty accident, which I won't go on into on air. Um, <laughs> but basically, I had to retire myself yeah. uh, because I broke myself fairly substantially. So, uh, and I really miss it. It was such a big 
well, small but big part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I also used to compete. So the competitive element, you know, I'm a fairly driven and competitive person and that was big for me. And I guess the same could be same for said for Clipper. I'd signed up to do that because I wanted an adventure. Yeah. And I want, you know, I'm very much a live life to the full kind of person. Um, but what's interesting about those experiences is the communities that you build in those sports and the way that you interact. And if you get coaches, for example, or skippers who shout people down and lead by command, you'll find really unhappy people below them who actually want to leave the club or get off the boat and it just doesn't work. And I think you see that in business as well. Those managers who I think we're getting less and less of, and you're seeing less and less of across the floors of the city, or certainly my experience is the ones who shout people down, they're just not, they're just not making their way in the world anymore. But with the with the greatest of respect to that, certainly, <laughs> certainly, I, I don't know, it's an extreme example, but with Clipper, yeah. Yeah. there will be times when a, when a skipper does need to be clear and directive, and then also, I suppose, other times when they need to show a human side. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you've kind of carried into work as well? Yes, but I think there's a difference and you can be clear and directive in a particular way without mm. making other people feel like they're not worth anything. Yeah, of course. So, for example, on the Clipper race, there are 12 identical yachts, one skipper and then amateurs on the boat. There are always boats who are unhappy because of the way the skipper drives the boat. Um, it's not always the case and, you know, it's still a fantastic experience. Whereas I was very fortunate that I was on a boat where... We were all, not only did we get on well, we had a you know, decent skipper who you could actually give feedback to and also you know, watch leaders and teammates and crewmates who you become these people's family when you're at sea. And mm. so you forge that bond. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's in the workplace. I'm not saying you become family with your colleagues, but if you don't treat people like human beings, if you don't give them the respect, um, but also the feedback where required in a human-centered kind of way, it's not going to end well. Yeah. So the way that I lead my teams, or I try and lead my teams, is to enable them to be the best people they can be. Um, because, you know, I, I remember listening to one of your earlier podcasts about leading from behind instead of front, and that yeah. absolutely resonated. Because it's, you know, I'm only as good as what they do. Well, look, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you for spending a bit of time and uh, sharing your experiences. Thank you very much. So do you, think, do you think the technology industry is really good at putting people off technology? Or at least the technical aspects of it, coding, etc.? I think people from the outside probably think that you are, like you, like you said earlier, trapped in a computer and there is no way out. Once you're in that tech bubble, yeah. then you don't have, you miss the social, social side of it, the business front. You're just there to do very in-depth technical stuff. Maybe that's what... Exactly. I, and I think that's the issue as well, the way you describe that in-depth technical stuff. And people are like, oh, well, what is this technical stuff I don't understand? I don't really care about it. Do you think there's a bit of a cult almost around technical, non-technical? You know, developers and software engineers are almost a little bit on a pedestal. Even, you know, oh, we're, we're slightly better because we understand how to code and we're a bit different from business people and they don't really understand tech. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Let's yeah. be honest, yeah. there is a bit of that, right? But yeah, yeah it's, it's like two sides, isn't it? It's like even when you, when you speak to clients and stuff and they're all like, oh, we're, this is a business facing, we're, we're business facing and we're not technology and that sort of thing. Then I find, like, even the technologists that you speak to, a lot of them are very much like, oh, well, we're the new cutting edge technology developers and mm. you might be old school IBM mainframe or do you get what I mean? So it's like yeah. I don't know, there, there, there is a bit of a competition. Yeah, the conversations like, uh, are harder I think. Yeah. I like I'm obviously technology focused in recruitment and I pref not prefer and I'm not putting I'm not generalizing it as well, but I do prefer the conversations with more business side because they're more conversational. Mm. And the people that are more technology focused, like the developers, the software developers um, even architects sometimes then the conversations are very a, yeah. a B C yeah, that's yeah. it now get off the phone mm -hmm. I need to get I am in awe of their like mind stuff oh, like, like, like technologists programmers developers coders do you know what I mean like I just wish my mind could, like could, yeah, could work like that and I could kind of deal with that pressure oh and yeah also the technology like I am in awe of their Minds. Yeah. If you take yes. if you take away a calculator from me, even simple arithmetic is wrong. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Yes, one hundred percent. Charlotte did say uh, in email actually that uh, she listened back to it 
and she didn't think she was very clear on the point she was actually trying to make, which was that actually we all love technology, demonstrate about how obsessed we are with our phones and apps on them. And business and leadership skills are transferable skills. And therefore being a woman in business should mean that she's exactly suited to leading the business side of a technology team or department too. So I'd love to see more women become technology business leaders and managers either because they're transferring from another sector into tech or simply because it's a path they're interested in or starting out like for me. Mm. Um, not just a solely a, a technical one. I think it's, it's, it's a tricky one because you don't want to say that there are two sides and they're not necessarily helping each other, but there are two sides and they aren't necessarily helping each other yeah. because yeah. there isn't an appreciation, as she says, that you can love tech without being technical. Yeah. And there is mm. I, there is a slight issue that maybe if you're a coder, you kind of feel slightly superior to others in the industry because you have a deeper understanding. Yeah. And that needs to go away. Yeah. I, is it something that ever will, though? I think at the end of the day, people say that, oh, we're not a tech company or we have back office and front office, right? At the end of the day, they're all working to... Together towards a, towards a common goal, yeah. but that's not how it comes across. Mm. So I don't know how you would solve that problem. Well, I I think well a lot of roles that have come out recently, um, they have had they're looking for someone that had a tech background, but is either looking to go into more manager role or business facing role. Mm. So I think a lot it is coming around. It's not so one side like one one side and then the other side. I think they are looking at getting people out of that technology as they develop in their career into the sort of manager roles mm. and then into very, very high high business facing mm. roles. So there is there there are them roles about. It's it's funny, like in academia, if you if you leave academia and you go and work in industry, academics basically have this idea that you failed in academia somehow. Mm. And it's like, you know, Charlotte went and started a degree in computer science, but she decided that she didn't want to be on the inside of a computer. Yeah. Didn't mean she failed at technology. It's just that she loves technology, but wanted to work in a slightly different angle and has a different skill yeah. set that suits itself yeah. to work in the industry in a slightly different way. Mm. And we need to get away from yeah. the stigma. Stuck. Yeah. It's, like, it's the whole perception thing, isn't it? Like, if you haven't completed that degree and then you haven't gone on and done the... the the, the extra qualifications and stuff around it then maybe you're not good enough and you're not going to cut the mustard do you yep. know what I mean so whereas I think what she's done is she's gone a little bit left field but still ended up in in a place where she's able to influence and and run a business unit and, and yeah, yeah. kind of have a job within that technology sphere but I think so she's at Schroeder's right there's other blue chip financial services firms that are now mixing the two together so yeah. there's parts of HSBC that first were traditionally very like split between technology and business. Um, they're kind of breaking down that barrier a little bit. Um, I think some of the regulations have helped and things like the, the ring fencing bank regulations where, you know, a bank needs to operate as a retail entity and as an investment banking entity. So I think it's, yeah. it's brought groups within the organizations a lot closer. Barclays are doing the same. Um, a lot of these big banks, asset managers have like an incubation hub which is effectively like a startup forum inside the business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in, in, in those incubation hubs, the technology and business is coming more and more closer together, yeah. um, which then makes, you know, which would then play into to what, what Charlotte was talking about in terms of having leaders that can do yeah. both on that side. I suppose as, as those teams get closer together, there's more of a chance that they're going to build relationships and maybe not become family, but mm. how important is that dynamic in the workplace? I mean, how close do you realistically feel to your colleagues? Very. I feel very close. I love my colleagues. You love your colleagues? I do. Very much so. I yeah. love, I love the, oh, the look that Akisha's giving you. <laughs> I'm talking about my wider team. Okay. <laughs> not just one, one person not in particular. Um, okay. I wasn't even making that link to it, but <laughs> For the benefit of everyone listening, I, I was just staring at Ali and like nodding I, my head. To, oh, um, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I think we have, uh, I think we have brilliant people in our company, and I, I find, especially because I just moved to London, I, I find that my colleagues are almost like my family. Hmm. I, just, I spend majority yeah. of my day with them. Yeah, yeah. and also yeah. I think it's WhatsApp groups as well. I mean, oh, yeah. like our work WhatsApp group in the evenings, we're all sending pictures of 
Oh, what food. we cook <laughs> at about at about five thirty. We're really? all, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're all kind of have. looking at recipes and going, "Oh, what are you cooking?" Someone might be saying, oh, mate, "I should oh, have showed you the curry I made last night." Yeah, so someone's like, "I'm cooking a risotto." Someone's cooking cheeseburger. Someone's broccoli. cooking salmon and broccoli. Um, he doesn't listen to his podcast, broccoli. but yeah, Tom eats salmon uh, salmon and broccoli every night. But um, yeah, so we all send pictures of each other's dinners and every and pancake dinner. day was great. And pancake day, every, we were literally sending like yeah. just photo after photo. But it is that sort of family. I think if without that family dynamic, it you wouldn't feel as happy in the workplace. Imagine hating your team and coming to work every single day, like nine till five or nine till six mm. or whatever the time you come in, and just not having that, mm. yeah, that's it. I suppose you know because we are so connected with each other 24 7 and not in a bad way but it's harder to disengage necessarily from work life yeah mm. if you do have someone who's going to shout people down that makes so much more you know Work is so important to people. If you're miserable, it makes a much bigger impact maybe than it would have done if you could have walked out the door 20 yeah. years ago yeah. and it was like, that's that. Yeah. 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 But also, yeah. I feel like I'm having conversations with work colleagues all day. Like, this might sound a bit sad, but like you speak to them obviously at work for work things and yeah, things that come up in your day. But then at the same time, a few of the guys, we support different football teams. So in the mm. evening, we might then be talking about the football that is on or not on at the moment. But do you get what I mean? So you're yeah. I find that sometimes up until like 11 o'clock at night we're, we're all having a chat about the same thing and when you actually take a step back you realise blimey I've been That's talking so to these sad. yeah <laughs> talking to these people all day but yeah. is that is that healthy? yeah of course yeah. it is they're your friends you, they're your friends it's encourages great. conversations right any yeah like if, if you look at like where the world is at the moment with mental health and, and people you know kind of in going into self isolation and people worrying about all that sort of stuff talking to people having a laugh keeping a bit active yeah. even if it's mentally do you know what I mean that's that's, that's, that's me. gonna that's gonna do do worlds of good for, for people it worries me about self-isolation though because uh, although yeah working from home is gonna be great two weeks at home I think as I'm, long as you still do those video calls with no but I just mean in, in engagement like, wise yeah. I'm gonna be so like video but with the world of technology you? we'll be able to uh, connect with each other very true yeah. you know what I mean? very true I was actually having a chat on LinkedIn with someone I know. We were talking about doing a virtual 5K running club. What, they having each other in the... Uh, like, I don't know. We're not enti- I'm not entirely sure yet. It's, it's, a, it's a very early stage conversation. <laughs> you both run with like GoPros or something. Someone just Put it on your head oh, with a helmet. Just, like, <laughs> Garmin and Strap. No, just like share runs and stuff. Oh, right. Yeah, to yeah. kind of encourage people to not, not just sit at home. At home. No, no, well, I don't know how to self isolate, do I? The office might shut, but I can still go outside. I haven't got any symptoms. I know, yeah. I thought you meant when we actually go into a World War Three mode. Well, we'll see. Uh, right, okay, let's go to our advert break. Charlotte, thanks very much for being our guest. When we come back, uh, we're going to be talking about Steam. Once a month, Tech Talks opens the Tuck Shop, a YouTube tech news roundup, which is kindly carried by Disruptive Live. Disruptive Live is the UK's first and only 24 7 TV channel for the technology industry. Stay up to date with all the latest industry news by following our regular talk shows broadcast live across the Disruptive Live website and social media channels. You can also catch Disruptive Live at some of the largest global technology events, broadcasting from London. Manchester, Singapore, Dubai, and many more. Welcome back to Tech Talks. The piece of technology news that I've I've picked out, Steam hits its all-time concurrent user peak over the weekend. More than 20 million people were logged on to the PC gaming platform. What is it? So Steam what? is an online PC gaming platform. Yeah, but like, what, like... PC gaming. Yeah. So yeah. rather than what like PlayStation and Xbox, oh, okay. rather game. than that, you play yeah. it on your like PC or laptop. Free so Steam. so games like Counter Strike, which you probably won't be familiar with. Anyway, point being, I <laughs> wonder what happened <laughs> over the weekend. Well, no, but obviously lots of people are stuck indoors, right? And they're looking for shit to do. So lots of people are just gaming. Great for the gaming industry. But I thought, throw it out there. What what are you going to get up to if you're stuck indoors? To be fair, right? To be fair, there was an article. Sony are reducing the bandwidth that they're allowing PlayStation users <gasps> for the next month oh, or so. People will not be happy. Yeah, yeah. So if you're like an avid COD player, 
Uh, is it slower? Yeah, yeah, so they're making it slow so they have enough. Is it, yeah. ti- is it time to get into Fortnite? I would, I would 100% Maybe. agree with them. They should be doing that. People shouldn't be spending so much time in front of the screen. Even if what else are they going to do? They've got a self isolate Read. You're going to swap from your laptop oh, to your point. phone to your phone to your TV. Yeah, what are, exactly. <laughs> you're you're going to get square eyes. You remember your mum used to tell different, you those Different stories. sizes though, don't worry. Right, you, <laughs> why did you self like reflect? What? Just what? Meditation. Meditation. Continuous meditation. I did see this. Is that learn yoga during your self isolation? Learn yoga. To be fair, on the way to work, I did order seven books from Amazon. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So seven different books. (laughs) Uh, Still in front of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. What? Sorry, hang on. What books? Oh, I was just going to say. Well, so that. there's a couple of novels in there. There's three autobiographies. Who? Um, there's Sir Alex Ferguson. Mm-hmm. There's a Kevin Peterson one, which I haven't actually read. I've read bits of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the last one is a Shane Warne. Are you so testing? I have a signed Shane Warne autobiography. Do I do, oh, right, yes. Yeah. I also, best autobiography I've ever read was Sir Bobby Robson's. Oh. Yeah, very good. Very Fair good. He's started a bit of life down the mind. Shane Warne. Sorry? If I said who is Shane Warne. Then you'd be disgraceful. Fine, that's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's probably the best. Well, you're, you're going to say the piss again because I'm taking it back to cricket, but he's a cricketer. Oh, is a cricketer? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Courtney, what would you read? Um, I'm more of a novel. I I like the old school stories. Yeah, like Jane Eyre. I've noticed that a lot of people are losing their shit because their gym is shutting, and they're like, "How yeah. am I going to exercise?" So. I, I, what? I don't like what? I don't like running, Push-ups? so I couldn't just go outside and just go for a run. I have to do school, like I would have to do weights, and I haven't got any weights. You know what I was thinking? Uh, I got kettlebells. Everyone yeah, was dissing Peloton oh, bikes a few months ago. Remember that? Yeah. When those Peloton bikes came out, everyone was like, "Oh, the price point is ridiculous." All this sort of stuff. Who's going to buy it? And now apparently their sales have gone through yeah. the roof. Yeah, but if everyone's at home, then your internet's going to slow down, and yeah, it's probably going to be really hard to get on. Like, what is what are them bikes? Sorry, did you just cycle home? Studio, home? studio cycling. But oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, get a kettlebell. I did a kettle. I did a. I shared with Cat earlier a kettlebell workout. For home. Yeah, I, my you, my uh, space in my flat isn't big enough. Like at but all. you but need about the two square ones. feet. Why don't you get the two the big little hand ones? The dumbbells. Yeah. I'm looking forward to intermittent <laughs> napping, to be fair. <laughs> intermittent yeah, napping? Yeah, honestly, I don't know what you lot on about gyms and that. Like, Are I'm, you going to have a siesta? Oh, I'm just going like, to... Do you know what I mean? Every, you feel a bit tired? Oh, just, Akisha's in a meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll have a little 20-minute power nap on my bed. It's very important. Knock out and then come back up. Do you know what I mean? It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to worry about ironing your shirts don't have to worry about all that sort of stuff just lounge around uh, on one last point with this by the way um, one thing that I loved over the weekend that I definitely think is going to cause some real issues but I would have a lot of fun with if I was older um, if they do ban 70 year olds from leaving the house for three months what if you're like in a couple where like one of you's 71 but the other one's 69 I'd be like sorry I'm just going down the pub yeah. oh, it's a real shame that you're not allowed to come <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't do that they can what do you mean? They're like, gonna, from next weekend, they're talking about 70 year olds being in the house for 40 How do they weeks. know that they're 70? Like, how genuine would they know? Well, apparently, the police are also <laughs> so going to be able to arrest you if you show symptoms, which, like, is a big problem. You've got hay fever. Oh my yeah, God. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I get really bad hay fever. I started, <laughs> so I started like, sniffing on the train today, and then I coughed, and this woman, I'm not even joking, stood up and ran away off the train and then back on the train one door passed yeah. and I, we're on the, I was on the circle line Madness. I saw it I saw her get back on I was like well Keisha like, yeah. you were saying your smoker cough got you in trouble yeah yeah <laughs> I was just I was just coughing and uh, just had some yeah again someone staring at me and I knew she was staring at me because whatever and I just t- I took one of my like headphones out and I just said look I'll be honest with you it's just a smoker's cough I've been smoking for about 12 years I get it all year Did round. You seriously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, God. I said, I'll be completely honest with you. Yeah, I was like, look, I've not had a fever. I've not got any of the symptoms. Do you get what I mean? Let's just carry on our journey. And then she kind of turned around and was like, oh no, no, I'm, you know, I'm just taking precautionary measures. And I was like, all right, okay, yeah. whatever. This woman just. I'm I just think everyone's getting chance. worried, though, innit? Let's 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 try and be a bit positive. There's a lot of stuff around, but I think. Do you know what I mean? Sorry, if I've got a new <laughs> cough. Though, if it is a new cough, it's really important yeah. that you do stay at home and get on steam. And, and get on or, 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 or read or yoga read. yoga yeah so, so hang on yeah. well, so suggestions were read Shane Warne's autobiography yeah do some yoga <laughs> self reflect so oh yeah meditation that, that mixes yeah. in with yoga though doesn't it yeah yeah meditation yeah. And maybe yoga, maybe maybe a kettlebell workout or something because 
if your flat's big enough. We're all gonna walk out in like three months' time. Everyone's gonna look like superstars. Know exactly who they are. I really don't think they are because if I you see what people are, are, are kind of, <laughs> people are going to shops and just buying shit to put in the cupboards for the next goddamn. And wh- when you're bored, what do you do? You eat or you drink? Yeah, I'm gonna eat so much. And also, everything else has been shut down. So like, I don't know, like my barbers over the weekend, they were like, <laughs> if they get. I was like, what am I going to do? My beard's going to grow out. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, oh, you not, you not he's going to come in. Huh? No, 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 no. I was like, what am I going to do? Like, where am I going to get my hair cut from? Like, serious. Well, that's, that's a point, yeah. That's this a is point. serious, because like, yeah. We might end up looking like Tom Hanks in Castaway. You never know. Do you know what I mean? He yeah. doesn't look terrible in that. I guess I think it's not bad. And also... Speedy recovery to Tom Hanks. We well. crushes number one. Right, okay, we're rambling. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, please do keep safe if you're self-isolating. Um, and do not cough in public. It sounds like a like a public announcement, doesn't it? Uh, but we'll be back. We will be back. What come what may, we will be recording through the coronavirus crisis. Be with you each step of the way. Exactly. 